Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion, and I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch stores on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Since you have clicked on this video looking for a review, I assume that you've already watched Doctor Who Season 12, Episode 2, Spyfall, Part 2. Nevertheless, for safety's sake, I'm going to issue myself a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes. It is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am the Fandime Master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me, and that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about a half an hour too early. This is neither a boast nor a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see all of the new stuff for the entire century that came before, and it oftentimes it impedes your ability to enjoy something. Well, so I'm not going to talk about the, anything about you know, the plot or anything like that. I assume you've watched it. Um, I do my reviews a little bit differently. I usually do kind of thoughtful reviews. You'll see me doing and talking about some things that maybe other people won't. That's what really distinguishes me is I try to be a little thoughtful about it. So when I go into reviews, I'm going to talk about first the writing. Well, this is a Chris Chibnall script. And everything that was wrong with season 11 is Chris Chibnall's fault. But he is now, finally, getting back to arcs. That is, the problem with season 11. There were no arcs. There weren't any character arcs. There weren't any season-long arcs, nor any companion-specific arcs, nor any doctor-specific arcs. It was just one-and-done shows. And that's not what we've become used to. And, and to be honest, I, I think it's something the show needs. Because just since 2005, each doctor has had their own you know, arc. But there were no characterization in season one. Do you know anything about these characters? Because I don't. There were too many companions from my perspective and too few episodes in which to do character development. Since 2005, the show has been as much about the companions as the doctor herself in this case. You really only want one companion. In a 13 episode season, you can develop a single companion in the Doctor. In a 10 part series, it's really harder to even do that. And with three companions and the Doctor, and only 10 episodes, it's really impossible. You have four characters at best, you get 2.5 episodes per character to try to do character development, or you overlook some. I mean, you can. You can do two companions, but only if they're kind of joined at the hip, the way that Amy and Rory were, and their character development basically just kind of fed off of each other in a feedback loop. I personally, I say, drop everyone but Graham. I think I love, I love Graham. He's a great character. I love him. Now we have arcs once again. For example, now the big arc that we're going to get for this Doctor, I think, is the Master destroying Gallifrey. And one has to wonder, why the hell did he do that, aside from being a raving madman? It puts me in mind, and this again is something where, as someone who's watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction, I know about this, there was Andrew Cartmel's master plan for Doctor Who. You see, the seventh Doctor, well, Cardinal had decided, and the producers at that time, that and this is classic Who, the seventh Doctor, that had, they had written about him enough that they had removed all mystery from the character. So if Seven had continued, if they hadn't gone on, it, it would have been revealed as the other. And this would be one of the primary figures in Time Lord history, along with Rassilon, Omega, and then the other. Uh, specifically, Cardinal said, once uh, Omega and Rassilon were the f uh, founding fathers of the Time Lord era of Gallifrey, um, they um, towered above the Time Lords uh, who followed. They were demigods and aces nifty dialogue and, coupled with the Doctor's neatly evasive response, are a subtle attempt to say that there was a third presence in the shadow of Gallifrey's creation. And in other words, the Doctor was also there. So he's... More, more than just a Time Lord, he's one of these half-glimpsed 
demigods. And that's the end quote. So you have to, you know, wonder, is that, do they have something like that in mind? Um, you know, the doctor has had a fair amount of the mystery taken out of her, so maybe this is an attempt to put something back in. We will have to see as the season goes on. One of the things I liked was this reference to contact when they were uh, making telepathic contact. That's a reference to Classic Who and uh, the Three Doctors. When two and three communicated telepathically uh, and they both said contact before they went back and forth and did it. I do like having these rather legendary computing figures with uh, Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. And in fact, when we get into this, we get into the facts of what some of these bigger companies are really doing, and, and it's really quite evil. You see, I was in IT for 40 years. I'm retired now, but that's what I used to do. And I really appreciate the uh, points that are being made here. Barton isn't wrong. Google, Facebook, Twitter, and some other social media really are doing this. And there's some worse about it, too. In 2012, Psychology Today, which is a magazine for psychological professionals, it's not pop psychology, they put out an article called Why We're All Addicted to Texts, Twitter, and Google. And there is a link to it in my description box. You see, people get positive responses on social media, and this releases dopamine. And this is a quote straight out of that article. You may have heard that dopamine controls the pleasure centers of the brain, that dopamine makes you feel pleasure and therefore motivates you to seek out certain behaviors, such as food, sex, and drugs. Recent research is changing this view. Instead of dopamine causing you exper to experience pleasure, the latest research shows that dopamine causes seeking behavior. Dopamine causes you to want, desire, seek out, and search it, it increases your general level of arousal and your goal, it's, it, your goal centered behavior. And that's an end quote. Essentially, this causes you to return to social media for more dopamine. After a while, you become literally, not figuratively, I never use the word literal to mean anything other than actually literally. You literally become addicted to this dopamine rush. And then you can't stop going back to social media because you need your fix. It, stopping it. If you stop social media, this will actually cause physical withdrawal. I've experienced this myself about two years ago when I quit social media. I thought I was going to quit it for good, but I'm only bound back on it now because I need it for engagement for this show. I think I avoid addiction. I'm not sure. I haven't tried to go without it for a while, but I think I avoid it by very, very draconianly thinking of social media as marketing platforms. And that's all. And in fact, Twitter killed my first account and then gave me a warning on my current account for this exact reason, for pushing marketing too heavily. Now, I enjoy engaging my viewers on social media, but for me, it's a marketing and engagement platform and very little else. I don't feel anything one way or the other when I get positive or negative uh, feedback by, from people, and trust me, I get both. If you're going to do a show like this, you can't be afraid of getting negative feedback. Now, in any case, social media sites, they know all about your dopamine addiction. They know that you can't stop using it. Why is everyone always looking at their phones? Well, they need this dopamine rush. And the SOBs at Google, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, they know all about your dopamine addiction. They actually have meetings to discuss how to keep you addicted. They are manipulating you in order to alter your belief system, your behavior to become more socialist, communist, and believers in things like identity politics. They are the worst sorts of drug dealers, no better than a street pusher who addicts you to heroin. In any case, <laughs> um, computing had a nice through line through this whole episode from the difference engine, which is in fact considered the first real computer in history, and Google, oh, I'm sorry, not Google. It's whatever the hell the name of that company is, but I don't remember, so I'm just gonna call it Google. But Barton's speech was perfection in my not so humble opinion. Chibnall actually did something perfect here. And I'm gonna repeat it because it's absolutely true. The speech went like this. Today, I'm here to say thank you to all of you around the world who've made our achievement possible. To everyone who, over the years, has given us everything. 
we gave you pieces of plastic and circuitry and games, and you handed us, me, my company, Google, total access to your lives. What you thought, what you buy, where you go, who you text, with who you text, where you text, every thought and photo and post, every credit card number, every birthday, every memorable place, and all your mother's maiden names. So thank you for carrying our cameras in your pockets, for putting our microphones in your bedrooms, signing up your kids, and handing them our devices. Now we told you, of course your lives are private, of course your data's safe, and you believed us. You kept clicking agree, and now we can do anything. This is absolutely true. Google is the worst offender, with Apple being a close second. They are pure, unadulterated evil. It's why I'm de google -fying as much as possible. This show's website is no longer on Google's platform, and my personal site is going to be off of it as very soon as well. I'm taking all of my documents, of which there are quite a lot due to my three-year stint and a, as an IT instructor at the place that shall not be named. And as well as all my photos, I'm taking those out of Google. Be, all this stuff's going to be residing on a pair of 10 terabyte hard drives that will be arriving within a week. My email for this show, and personally, is now with Proton Mail, a service whose even their administrators can't see your mail. It's all encrypted. My next phone will be explicitly chosen so that I can replace its stock Android operating system with one that does not have Google's services on it, and therefore none of Google's spying. You will never see a personal assistant like Alexa in my home, ever. We now know for absolute fact that it is listening to you and sending everything it hears back to its manufacturer. You put one in your bedroom and it will listen to you have sex. Just think about the implications of that for a moment. Google is pure, unadulterated evil, and I'll have no more of it. It's worth paying something less than a hundred bucks a year to be out from under its thumb. Never forget, Google and Apple, all these social media sites, they're unadulterated evil. And the social media sites are drug dealers. Now those are the good moments in the script. There were a lot of good moments. It was a good script. This was this first pair of episodes was the first time with Chibnall that I actually, you know, was kept guessing to some extent. Last season was completely predictable and boring. So, I do want to talk about cringe moments. I am not sure how I feel about the destruction of Gallifrey. It feels like they are returning to the characterization of the Doctor being the last of the Time Lords. That characterization had pretty much run its course, and so by the time that they got to the day of the Doctor, really there was nowhere else to take it. So they removed it from his character going forward. So returning to this characterization may not necessarily be a good thing. I maybe would have preferred to go another direction. And uh, one of the bigger problems dramatically with the script, as with all the Chibnall scripts, do the Doctor spends a lot of time just monologuing rather than figuring something out through the action of the episode. Always remember, in any drama, especially TV and film, show, don't tell. The Doctor spends a lot of time under Chibnall just telling. Um... <laughs> I'm sort of amused, in a way, it's, uh, you know, it's both a cringe and not, that the Master is still alive, with no explanation. Although, to be honest, that has been consistent throughout Doctor Who, all the way back you know, to the very first time that the Master showed up in Classic Who. He survived certain death with absolutely no explanation at all. I, that's fine, I don't mind. It's just, you know, occasionally you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. He was dead, you know. <laughs> I mean, Missy died, and supposedly she couldn't regenerate. I guess they were wrong. Um, the tissue compression eliminator, the TCE, that comes from classic Who, something the doctor, I mean, the master used to do is shrink people down and kill them. I generally like the fact that it's back. I just don't like the execution because just as in classic Who, the shrunk people have the same problems. They looked like dolls or figurines, uh, not even action figures. It just didn't look real. They didn't look like real shrunk human beings. 
Um, you know, due to the do the historical figures that the doctor interacts with have to always be female. It smacks of identity politics. I mean, Babbage in particular, he said, but like all great ladies, she is as much for decoration as for purpose. Now, I have no idea if that was Babbage's real attitude towards women. I don't know that much about Babbage, aside from the fact that he created something and historically we consider the first computer. It is entirely possible that that would have been his attitude. I mean, that was the attitude of the era. But it still just smacks as identity politics, and it's just, it's irritating. Um, the Nazis miss the doctor, Ada Lovelace, and, and uh, Inyat Katz, Khan's radio. Um, they did that from time to time. If they thought you were harboring somebody, they'd shoot your floor. The Nazis weren't that bad of shots. They did do that sort of thing, but they would just indiscriminately hit everything, not just a little piece, and somehow miss somebody under the floorboards. They they were thorough. They would blow the hell out of the floorboards. Uh, it was kind of interesting, the master living through the 20th century, um, he would have had to have, uh, you would think that sometime during that, let's see, about 60, 70, 80 years, I guess, he would have tried to have set himself up as a dictator, but... He probably didn't do it because it would have messed up his own timeline because he was there very actively when the doctor was uh, exiled to Earth in the 60s and 70s. He was there in 1999, and he's been in the post-2005 series on Earth several times. One thing I have to wonder, what became of the Master's TARDIS? The doctor brought it with her to the 20th century, and then we never see it again. I mean, uh, 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 where? What's happened to it? I mean, she put it someplace? She hidden it? We have no idea. I assume probably what we're going to find out is the Master somehow gets access to it, and that's how he's going to meet up with her the next time. Uh, one of the nice things about this is I think that, you know, this arc is going to have to include the Master, since he did, in fact, destroy Gallifrey. So, Why did Barton kill his mother? I mean, is it just because he's pure evil? I mean, that's even over the top for, you know, Google executives. Well, then again, on the other hand, maybe it's not. I have to also ask, this is not something specific to Doctor Who, but I have to ask, what is the deal with men on TV these days who have half-shaven beards? I mean, look at mine, right? This is a normal beard. It requires some upkeep. I, ha upkeep. I, have, to, I have to shave it once or twice a week um, in a very specific way to make it look good, and believe it or not, probably you can believe it, I'm dyeing it. I'm dyeing it brown, back to my normal hair color, because it's coming in patchy and weird now that I'm getting older. It's brown in some spots, white in other spots. So when you see this skunk beard that I've got going on here, anytime that you see a skunk beard, the person's dyeing their beard, absolutely. Um, Ted Cruz um, is dyeing his beard. You don't get this, this skunk beard look by accident. It just doesn't happen. But I, these scruffy, sort of half-shaven beards that, you know, bad guys, almost always bad guys on TV, they just look stupid, you know. Either, either grow a beard or, or shave. It just looks dumb. So we get into acting now. Uh, Jodie Whittaker, I liked her a lot here. The discovery that the Gallifrey was destroyed thereby eliminating anything that she had accomplished with the Day of the Doctor uh, was a good moment. Uh, when you can get a real serious close-up on somebody and just see it in their eyes, it's, it, that's great. I liked when she called the Master by name. He loves being called the Master. He always has. Um, he said in the classic series, what do you call the Master universally? But the way she acts it, it makes it totally clear that the only reason she's saying this is because he's making her, and I like that bit. We get to companions here. Um, Bradley Walsh is Graham. As always, I like him. Maybe it's just that we're similar ages. I think he's a bit older than I am, but hell, who the hell knows? Maybe we're the same. But I like him a lot. I think he's probably the best of the three. I would dump all the rest of them. Um, it, it is really too hard to do character development for four characters with only ten episodes. And there's another thing. Until very recently in human history, and I'm talking about the late 19th, early 20th century, women were second-class citizens. Having a male companion means that the doctor would have a front 
person, somebody who can stand in front and listen and be the authoritative one when she goes way back in time and, you know, she's just considered little more than property. I mean, there's going to be times like that most of the time in human history. That's the way it was. You need a male front man who basically just stands there trying to look smart while the doctor figures everything out. <laughs> um, that's what I would do. I would get rid of everybody except Graham. Um, Sacha uh, Dewan. Um, I like him a lot as the master. And I, I like, too, that he, he played uh, the classic Who director, Waris Hussein, in An Adventure in Space and Time, which was part of the 50th anniversary. I think that's a neat sort of touch. Um, I, you know, you sort of have a question, though. Why is he insane and doing evil things again? Because he had reformed in his last incarnation that we saw him as the mistress. Is this just a function of regeneration? Um, after having seemingly been permanently killed, maybe it's some kind of side effect. I don't know, but it does bear some kind of explanation. Then there's Lenny Hen uh, Henry as uh, Daniel Barton, the Alphabet CEO. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, CEO of whatever. Uh, but he is the Alphabet CEO of uh, Sundar Pichai. Um, Alphabet is a holding company for Google and other sister companies. He is, he is exactly the sort of SOB that Google and YouTube's executives would be. These people are evil. Evil down to the core of their blackened, shriveled souls. I'm an atheist, but I almost hope there's a God so that these people will go straight to hell for all eternity because they are evil. I liked Sylvie Briggs as Ada Lovelace. There is, in fact, a programming la language called uh, Ada, named Ada, named after her. Um, she was a real figure in computing history and a big one. Mark Dexter as child ba Charles Babbage, he really did invent the difference engine, the first what we consider a real computer in modern times, or, you know, modern being the <laughs> 19th century. Um, again, not real thrilled with the way he was written necessarily, but I don't know enough about the guy to say whether he was like that or not. Either way, it just smacked of identity politics. Then there was Aurora Marion as Noor Inyat Khan. She was the British Women's uh, Auxiliary Air Force Service member, member. She was both of Indian and American descent. And she trained for wireless operations and was fluent in French. She was the first female uh, wireless operator to be sent from Britain into occupied France to aid the French resistance during World War II and is Britain's first Muslim war heroine. I did not know she existed. Um, Neat little touch that they got in touch with somebody like that again. Does it always have to be women? It, it just smacks of identity politics. I really don't care, you know, as long as the character is well written and everything. But it, when you get into smacking of identity politics, it bothers me a little bit. We can get into the direction. It was directed by Lee Haven Jones, who uh, directed the last one. Um, the shots in the cinematography are good. There's nothing really to get excited about. Everything is really in the lighting. And, man, the lighting was really, really good. It, it, almost every scene, not almost, every scene, used, used lighting to its advantage. If you walk through this scene, it's all about mood setting with the lighting. And it is particularly um, notable when Barton is giving his speech. I mean, look at that. Look at that. That does not happen by accident. That's great lighting. I really like this lighting. That's awesome. Um, then there was a the music by Sigun uh, Akinola. Um, it's effective. I didn't dislike the music. There was nothing wrong. I have over 400 soundtracks in my music collection. I'm a huge audiophile and a fan of uh, orchestral film scores like the ones we're hearing here. There's nothing that's wrong with this one. But it does lack the musical themes that are specific to the Doctor, their companions, their antagonists. It is hard not to compare him to Murray Gold, who did the music from season 1 through season 10, because Murray Gold always had specific musical themes for any specific character, and it was a way that he put these themes together that helped underscore all the action. Again, there's nothing wrong with this music. Nothing ever strikes me as wrong. I can always tell when it's wrong. There's nothing wrong with this, but it just doesn't have that, and I'm not sure that's a good thing. Special effects here are fine. Hell, you only ever mention if it's bad, and it wasn't. <laughs> 
Costuming, well, the period costuming was good. Uh, what do you expect? It's period clothing. Uh, I like the fact, and I did the last episode too, that the doctor and the companions were wearing a very James Bond-like clothing. I, I got a kick of that, especially got a kick out of it when um, Graham was talking to the, uh, you know, uh, Google security guys, you know, do you want me to do it, you know, start doing a tap dance? Uh, I thought that was great. Very, very Bond-esque. Again, they have the best stuff to Graham. <laughs> I say keep him, bitch, titch the, bitch, t just bit, get rid of the others. <laughs> One thing you have to ask, though, why can't the doctor wear, like, normal pants and shoes or maybe a skirt or even a dress? Why does she have to wear the same pants with the weird-looking uh, socks and, uh, you know, hiking boots? What, why can't she, like, everybody else changed? Why can't she change? It's not like she has to wear high heels that would impede her movement. She can wear flats. W why? You know, I, I guess it's just because she's the, doc the doctor. Uh, makeup here, there wasn't anything to say about the makeup. It was all perfectly fine and appropriate to the era. So, at this point in the review, after I pretty much walked through everything I'm going to walk through, we have to have a recommendation. Is this any good? Yes, I think this was a good episode. These first two episodes were the first fracking time that Chris Chibnall has actually kept me guessing a little. And that's difficult to do. As I have said, I've watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. And it does sometimes interfere with your ability to enjoy things. You just find out there isn't that much that's actually new. And so last season it was all like, oh God, I know exactly what's going to happen. Fifteen minutes of the episode, I know exactly what's going to happen. These two kept me guessing. Last week's reveal of the Master, I had no idea he was coming. I had no idea. That was great. And we got some of that yet this season, um, the, to the, tonight rather, this, this episode, see, episode two. We got some of that same stuff where I was kept guessing. I didn't know, like when she, you know, sort of teleported into the uh, 19th century. I didn't, I didn't know where she was. You know, I had to figure out that along with her. That's great. You know, some of these historical figures, I knew about them personally, but I had to, you know, when she would discover them, I'm like, oh, wow, that's Ada Lovelace, or wow, that's Charles Babbage, that's cool, you know. So yes, I would think this is a very good pair of episodes. I would definitely recommend them. Uh, for the first time, really, Chibnall has given us scripts where I was kept guessing, and that is hard to do. And that is all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of the highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from S.Y.L. Ranch, the BitChute channel where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.